<laughs> Thanks so much, everyone, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here in person as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, as was mentioned, my name is Renee. I'm a PhD student from the University of Melbourne Health Economics Group. And today I just would love to talk to everybody about our paediatric multi instrument comparison study uh, and talk a little bit about the feasibility of conducting the study and collecting that health related quality of life data, uh, which I think has some really important implications for people who want to do that in future. And then also talk a little bit about some results from the study. So uh, how acceptable some of the commonly used health related quality of life instruments are to children and their caregivers. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, and this is just to introduce you to the um, paediatric multi instrument comparison study team. Uh, so this work is isn't just me, it's done on behalf of an amazing group of people up there. Um, Kim Dalziel, Harriet Hiscock, Brendan Mulhern, Nancy Devlin, and some other amazing research assistants and PhD students. Uh, just to quickly mention that we're funded by a, an Australian government grant, but also by the Europol Research Foundation, uh, who uh, produces one of the instruments that's included in this analysis. <clears throat> As a little bit of background as to why we undertook this paediatric multi-instrument comparison study. <laughs> um, so the generic health related quality of life instruments uh, are primarily used in clinical trials, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, and, and that is often used to inform economic evaluation. We're also um, increasingly seeing them used uh, in, as part of routine clinical care, uh, as well as in population research uh, and registries. But in the paediatric space in particular, there's a real lack of evidence uh, around the comparative performance of how these different commonly used instruments uh, perform, especially across different cohorts of children with different conditions and different child age groups. So often we find, find that one of the instruments might be validated in one uh, age group for one condition, um, and then you know, another instrument uh, is validated in another age group and condition. But it's really hard for us to tell, you know, when we compare them head to head, how they perform across that same group of children. So hence the <laughs> paediatric multi-instrument comparison study. Uh, and so I suppose following on from, from that, with that study was done to sort of address those major gaps in the literature. Uh, and what I'm hoping to talk to you today about is firstly understanding the quality of the data that we've collected, because that's really important for us um, when we're making conclusions from these data um, that it is robust and that we can rely on the data that we've collected. Um, and then also talking about um, the instrument acceptability to children and their caregivers as well. So this is just a quick overview of what the paediatric multi-instrument comparison study sort of looks like in one slide. <laughs> um, so I've talked a bit about why we're doing it. Um, just an overview of, I suppose, the population that we've included. So at the moment, the sample has over 6,000 Australian children aged 2 to 18. And we sort of, we have three key samples that sit underneath that. So we have 1,000 children that we have recruited from a uh, paediatric tertiary hospital in Melbourne. And then the other two samples are collected from an online panel. Uh, and uh, so we've got 1,800 kids who are sort of the general population sample, so generally quite well children. And then we have 3,800 kids that represent sort of one of nine different common health conditions to try and get some representation of how these instruments perform across kids from, with different health conditions. So they received two surveys, an initial survey that has all of the commonly used instruments head to head in the survey, as well as some other information about their demographics, who they are. Um, and then either four weeks later or two days later, depending on which group they're allocated to, they receive a, a shorter follow-up survey that you know, drops off all those demographic questions that we've already asked and just ask them to repeat those health related quality of life instruments. We did ask that children aged seven years or older self-report the health-related quality of life instruments. 
although acknowledging that some condition groups that we're selecting from that might not be feasible or possible, we provided caregivers with the option to select if they thought that their child was um, capable and able to answer some questions about their health and wellbeing. So we left that decision up to them. Um, and I suppose where we hope that this, <laughs> the outcomes of this research will go, um, you know, feeding back into um, decision making for clinical trials, economic evaluation, decision making and outcomes measurement. So the aim of what the analysis I'm going to talk to you about today was firstly to talk about the feasibility of collecting that data. We learned a lot <laughs> along the way and I think it's really important to share across the research world. Um, so, so that's the first part. The second part, as I briefly touched on, was the acceptability of some of, some of those commonly used instruments. So um, that includes the PEDSQL, the EQ5DY instruments, the CHU9D, the AQUAL60, the PROMISE25 and the QE2 um, slash three. If, if that means nothing to you, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay too. They're just commonly used generic instruments. Uh, and then uh, we also really wanted to understand how some of these things compared by some important subgroups. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that along the way. So just briefly, uh, I mean, we've talked a bit about the data um, and how it's collected. This analysis is just restricted to the five to 18 year olds, mainly because most of the instruments under the age of five are quite experimental. So we really just want to focus on um, the more established instruments. Uh, and I've already talked about just briefly the instruments that we've included, but just to flag that um, beyond those generic instruments, some children also receive condition specific instruments. So in some later analysis, we hope to compare how those condition specific and generic instruments perform. For those of you who aren't familiar with some of these instruments, this just gives you a brief rundown of uh, sort of the core components of the instruments that are included. So the PEDSQL is a 23 item, so a longer item generic instrument. Um, the EQ5DY is the shortest at five items. The CHU9D is nine items. The AQUAL60, 20 items. The HUI, 15 items and the promise 25 items. And you can see those slightly different recall periods and outcome scales. So just to talk to you about the methods, I suppose in terms of the feasibility, what we mean by that and what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, you know, what are the types of participants that we were able to collect through this study? Um, a bit about some follow-up survey completion rates, uh, and then I think probably the, the most important bit is the quality of the sample and, and the procedures that we used to try and uh, ensure a high quality sample. Then in terms of acceptability of the instruments to the, the children and their caregivers, uh, uh, we asked participants to self-report the difficulty they found completing each instrument. So talk to you about those results and then the time to complete each instrument. Um, and then comparing them across some, some key subgroups there. So starting to think about the feasibility of collecting the paediatric health related quality of life data. I briefly just wanted to show you that sort of a bit of a participant flow. So um, 9,820 children completed the initial survey. And then in our analysis that I'll talk to you a little bit more about next, there's almost 6,000 kids, but as you can see, we dropped, we removed quite a number of children for not meeting some pre-specified um, minimum criteria. So first I'm gonna to talk to you about the 6,000 kids that are in the sample um, and, and, and about that. And then I'm gonna to talk to you <laughs> about um, the, the almost 4,000 kids that were removed. So I suppose just a little bit on some survey completion rates. We don't know how many, children were invited into the sample. Um, so we can't work out how many were invited and then uh, consented, um, mainly because some of our recruitment strategies included, you know, social media where, you know, people might see an ad and they're not, you know, so it's hard for us to track. But um, what we do know is how many consented and then how many completed. So, you know, we, we can see about 90% of the participants who consented to take part, which was sort of, pretty much the first question on the survey completed that initial survey. And then 
you can see um, a fair drop off in some follow up survey completion rates. So, um, the hospital sample, you can see 80% of participants completed the follow up survey. But then once you look at the online panel, you can see that that drops off quite a bit. So, you know, 80% compared to 33% is quite a difference. So that was a real, I suppose, feasibility finding for us that um, collecting that data in that hospital clinical setting was really hard and expensive, but really advantageous in terms of getting that follow-up response rate. Um, and I suppose, yeah, pitfall of that more affordable, efficient approach of the online panels was that we had that large drop off. Um, when we looked at, because we asked the demographics at the initial survey, we could have a look at who completed the follow up versus who didn't for that online panel. Um, and I suppose unsurprisingly, uh, we had some differences for that, that online panel population. So, you know, uh, some differences included caregiver education, remoteness, language spoken at home and children with chronic health condition. Uh, so lacking a bit of representation in the follow-up survey from the online panel in those groups, which I think is in, an important finding and important for us to consider moving forward with how we analyse this data. So this just gives you an overview of the sample. So I spoke briefly about uh, the online panel having nine health conditions. So this table just shows you those nine health conditions. We were aiming for about 400 in each, some, <laughs> some a little bit trickier to recruit than others. So the eating disorder and epilepsy sample were a real challenge for us to recruit via the online panel. Um, so another feasibility finding, I suppose, that it has to be you're quite a prevalent condition to be able to obtain a, a larger sample in online panels. And then I briefly just wanted to flag that we, we divided instruments into core and additional. So core instruments included the PEDS-QL, the CHU9D and the EQ5D instruments. The reason for that is that they're the most commonly used uh, in sort of clinical trials context. Um, and so everyone received the, all those instruments. The hospital sample we felt was, and through some piloting, um, it was really important for us to keep that survey quite short. So we dropped off the additional instruments from the hospital sample. So only the online panel participants received the aid for the QE and the promise. And uh, through some more piloting, it was still important for us to keep that survey quite short still in the online panel. So they were randomised, the online panel was randomised to receive one of those three. So that's why you see quite a difference in the number of, uh, you know, participants who have completed the PEDSQL versus the, do you have a question? Can I jump over the question? Or do you oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm just curious, how did you identify the core instruments compared to the ones that are in the bottom list there? It was a long process. <laughs> um, there are a couple of literature reviews. I think Donna Rowan did a literature mm -hmm. review in yep. um, 21, I think yep. it was, that really helped guide us in choosing some core instruments. Uh, and then, you know, there was lots of discussions with the wider Quokka team um, around which instruments would form sort of core and additional. Yeah, um, yeah so that sort of. So in terms of socio-demographic factors, uh, quite an even spread of sort of gender and child age across the samples, which was important for us because we wanted to be able to subgroup by age and still have a, a large enough sample to do some analysis. Um, have a fair percentage of children with a chronic health condition. But again, as you can see, 79% of the hospital sample had a chronic health condition uh, compared to I think 48% in the condition group from the online panel sample. So really finding children with more chronic health conditions in that hospital sample again. Caregiver education was a tricky one for us to manage. It's quite high that the sample from hospital was quite highly educated. Um, which is a, you can see the population norm is about 30% and then in the hospital sample it's 46%. Um, so the online panel sample was actually better for us in obtaining, uh, I suppose, a more rep Australian representative uh, for 
education and then also for single parent household. Oops, sorry. Um, so yeah, I've spoken a lot about <laughs> you know the pitfalls of online panel recruitment, but this was definitely a, um, a benefit for us as so. well. So now going back to, I think I, I showed you that um, participant flow slide of, you know, we've removed almost 4,000 participants. So I just wanted to talk to you about that and the process for doing that. So before going into the study, we came up with uh, a set of pre-specified minimum criteria that we felt was acceptable that people needed to meet to be included in the sample. And as you can see, it's really, it's largely based not on how they reported their quality of life, but how they, if they reported in the survey being who they said they were at the screening stage. So really around eligibility, aside from the time to complete, um, so people who just sort of like whizzed through were removed, but that was really quite minimal. But it was really important for us to focus in on um, are these participants, especially in the online panel, because we don't, you know, we don't know them <laughs> and we don't have any engagement with them. Are they who they say they are? Um, and so these were sort of our criteria. And then we also kept an eye on some other things that we, you know, that might flag, oh, maybe this person isn't, you know, a, a child self-reporting during school hours. Um, you know, they might be home from school for whatever reason. Um, so we, we still allowed them into the sample, but we just wanted to make sure that, that those occurrences were, were quite minimal. Um, so here is um, the, the top row there shows you participants who failed one criteria, one or more. So they're the ones who we removed. And then underneath that, you can see the reason for removal. So I'm just going to highlight, that I think, what the key message <laughs> here is that the hospital sample we only removed about 2% and the online panel is, is largely where we, where we were removing participants for not being who they said they, they were, I suppose. I suppose importantly, uh, some groups were subject to more criteria than others. So for example, the general population sample, you know, they didn't have to have a condition, so we didn't check them for that. But the, the condition groups, it was really important for us to check you know, they said at screening that their child had epilepsy. Do they then say that in the survey? And if they didn't, then we removed them. And you can see that stark difference. Um, so all of these participants are removed from the sample before we do any analysis. But I just, you know, I thought it was really important to share that finding with you um, that when we're collecting data, especially from online panels, that rigorousness um, <laughs> that's needed around, and I think especially around condition groups. Um, so just a, an important finding for us. And then we, we wanted to check after we removed those participants, what was the quality of the, the data that people were reporting? So for very similar items, for example, the EQ5DY pain item and the CH9D pain item are very similar. So we wanted to have a look and see, you know, are participants reporting very different answers for these very similar questions. And, what we found was, you know, I suppose quite promising that, you know, once we remove these participants, that, you know, those occurrences are, are quite minimal. Um, so we're sort of summarising that, you know, we're quite happy with the quality of the data once we've removed those participants. So now jumping, <laughs> jumping across into um, the acceptability of the instruments, uh, which are, if you're a user of the instruments, is probably a slightly more exciting <laughs> um, stage of the research than maybe the logistics of actually doing it. So I mentioned that we asked each participant to report how difficult or easy each of the instruments were to complete whilst they were completing it. Uh, the, the order of the instruments was randomised as well, so just to flag that. But as you can see, most people found most instruments sort of either somewhat or very easy to complete, which I think is a really good sign. Um, generally, the understandably, probably the longer instruments um, participants are reporting as, as, as slightly more difficult to complete, uh, which I think is understandable. I think, you know, 25 items is a, is a large number of items to be completing. But yeah, I mean, not dissimilar when we do compare them statistically, the EQ5DY5L does 
the report being the easiest of of all of them. But you know, I think a promising result for most of the instruments there. Then we looked at time to complete. Um, again, I suppose as you would expect, the longer instruments taking a bit longer to complete. Um, a really interesting finding is that participants get faster on the second round, which you know I suppose reflects the learning effect. But also when we're thinking about using them in other contexts like clinical care context, you know, the first time we ask a patient to complete it, they might find it tricky, but then to know that, you know, they get quicker and they probably find it easier each time to do it. Um, yeah, uh, the EQ5GY and 5L and 3L the quickest. Um, yeah, we had a quick look at, you know, time per item, which is really, it's a bit crude of a result really, because, you know, this, this, this is just the, the time divided by the items, but people still have to read the intro at the start. So I suppose just, just interesting to look at, but um, yeah, helps, I suppose, guide participant, uh, future users as to, you know, if they are gonna include an instrument, how long will it take people to complete? Um, and generally the, the shorter time, usually the more acceptable. Then I mentioned earlier that we were really interested in how does this compare by different groups of kids. So we saw faster completion times and a greater ease of completion for younger children compared to older children, proxies compared to self-report, online panel participants compared to hospital participants, which is, that one is, I suppose, expected because online panel participants are quite familiar with surveys, they do them all the time. You know, you could understand that they're, they, they're probably quicker and find them easier to complete than people who have maybe never seen or haven't often completed surveys. And then general population participants are also faster and found them easier compared to the condition groups. And we think that that's because the condition group sample is having to choose which of the levels, you know, they're not just sort of the general population is probably selecting or largely selecting no problem. So it's not too hard to, to think about and that's quite quick. But, you know, if you're part of a, a group that has a condition, some of those items, you know, you're having to think about, okay, well, which, you know, do I have a little bit of a problem? Is it a lot of a problem? So a bit more thinking involved. I suppose in summary, one of the main messages we wanted to get across is the importance of quality assurance and quality checking with online panel samples. Um, I'm really happy to talk with people more if you, you know, if you do have an a online panel um, sample planned, our process for doing that in more detail. But, you know, after we removed them, it was, uh, you know, we were happy with the quality of the data. Um, so I suppose logistically it was important for us to have that in the contract with the online panel company that we wouldn't pay for any of those illegitimate respondents because otherwise it gets quite expensive quite quickly. Um, we, we're, we thought that all instruments did demonstrate acceptability to children and their caregivers, but some were easier and quicker to complete than others. Uh, and instrument times in this study were quicker than those reported by sort of guides that the different instrument developers put out. Um, it might be that that's because it's an online survey, um, or it might be that those guides are a bit more conservative. But I suppose, you know, our hope is that if you are doing an online survey, you might be able to use these times as a bit of a guide for how long it will take people to complete. Um, we, we do hope that it helps people um, conduct their research in future and guide future users to select an instrument. But we do know that there's a lot more analysis um, needed to guide that decision making and that is in the pipeline. <laughs> um, so what next for the paediatric multi-instrument comparison study? So we do plan to expand to an international paediatric multi-instrument comparison study. So we'd love to hear from anyone either online or in the room that has an interest in being involved in that. Um, you know, we, we selected nine conditions, but that is in no way exhaustive of all of the conditions that you could look at. So would be would really love to hear from people if you think there's any other conditions in particular that would be important to validate these instruments in. Um, what else? We've got um, 
we obviously have to do a much wider range of psychometric tests to compare these generic instruments. So we've got that planned, comparing the generic and the condition specific um, across those different child ages and health groups, and then some other detailed tests. And then what's next for me um, is being part of that broader psychometrics analysis, but also um, I'm really interested in, in taking some of one of these, one or two of these generic instruments um, and trialing them as a routine uh, outcome measure in paediatric clinical care for children with chronic health conditions. So if you have any thoughts on that, I would love to, <laughs> love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, that's everything from me. So thanks for listening and very happy to take questions. So I'll jump in. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. Thanks so much for sharing your work and your going through this. It's just tremendous all the work that Cook has been doing, especially this um, multi instrument comparison. Um, I'm a little, I'm so curious to hear a little bit more about the timing of the, um, the results, the timing of those various instruments, because the Eurocall group um, will typically say, I think that to budget about five minutes for their instrument. And so um, I'm curious to hear kind of if there are other you know, timing recommendations for the other instruments and how kind of your results compare to those. And if there were any um, parts such as introductory materials of the the ID that you didn't have to include here that someone else might have to include that wasn't part of that timing. Yeah, a very good question. Really struggled to find anyone reporting the time to complete in the mm -hmm. literature. It really, um, I don't think it's something that uh, uh, is, is common for people to report. Um, there was a report, I think, of the PEPQL taking maybe 2.3 minutes, and our sample was faster than, than that. The EQ5D was really hard for us to find any report other than, you know, as they say, they say it takes a couple of minutes. Our only theory was that, um, and maybe this is something we need to talk to the Eurocall group about, is some of the instruments can be interviewer administered. So maybe uh, that right. takes longer, whereas yeah. the participants here are just completing online. Um, but in summary, definitely much quicker than, you know, what's reported in those guides. But uh, I think probably important for us to reach out to those developers and understand if those timings are what those timings are based on and if it's interviewer administered online uh, yeah right. and if they could add some of your results to their um, information as well would be great um and then just the thing that's really helpful you're right i bet that their recommendation is based on your interview administrators because that is how they develop it um but and just an observation that for um, we're seeing the same alarming trend for all of our online surveys that over the years that the response times have become faster and faster. And it is it's alarming. And you know, it's as you have noted here, you know, people choose the ones that you think is the same thing. Uh, but this is remarkable to is actually for the ones that are quite close to where we determine the cutoff. They actually do look valid. So it's just really interesting. Anyway, I don't know if you have any observations about that um, in terms of this experience. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, some of the, the ones where they, the timing one, I think is an interesting one. Um, I think they can still be valid even if they're quick, especially if they're in this context, a child with no health problems. So they're just, you know, they are selecting no problems. It, you know, it would, you know, I can imagine how you could be quick. It, you can see how it would be feasible for it to be quick. Um, but the legitimacy of the ones where they had, you know, they, they screen as being a, a child with epilepsy and then you look at some of their results and it just looks, it, you know, it looks very odd um, when you sort of look at that raw data. So I think where they're not meeting, you know, that eligibility criteria, yeah. it does look a bit weird, but I agree. I think that the timing is an interesting one. And, you know, if we should be removing them or not, it's probably a, a good question. But um, I think you can probably be quite quick and still be legitimate if you're quite a well child, possibly. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great presentation. That was really clear. And I learned a lot about different instruments and thinking about how to, yeah, I think it's interesting to think about how that 
will be useful in clinical care if really it's typical results. And um, I think somewhere in the beginning, you, asked, you mentioned that some of the participants filled it out two days later and some filled it out four weeks later. Did you see any differences? I know you haven't looked at the um, outcomes yet, but any differences in that more needed to be excluded when there were four weeks in between or any, any differences in those two groups across the results? Yeah, a really good question, actually. I didn't mention it, but the two-day group did have a slightly higher follow-up rate than the four-week group. Um, so that was an interesting finding of those two. You know, doing it at a shorter interval gets you a, a, a you can understand why, like people are probably still engaged. Um, so that was an important finding from the two-day versus the four-week. In terms of difference between the groups, the two-day group were was possibly selected to be a generally well group because their, their intended use of that data is for a test retest um, reliability assessment. And so they are quite different to the four week group in that, um, you know, that they're, I suppose, we, we selected those 250 to be from that general population sample. Um, so they are different, but it's a little on purpose. <laughs> thank that you. Would answer. Yeah, thank you. Sandra Sandberg has his hand yeah. raised. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I have a, a question uh, about patient reported outcomes, the time frame. Uh, typically, uh, these were designed for clinical trials where you like to see changes, say, when you introduce a medication or, or some other uh, regimen, uh, and so that you could see changes over time. However, lots of uh, chronic medical conditions are episodic. And um, so I wonder how you, you've thought about that. Uh, and second question, um, in your final slide, you have thoughts about introducing measures into ongoing care. So I've been doing that for many, many years now. And I think I would not use these generic health-related quality of life measures at all, because very often they don't um, lead to directly actionable information. So I think whatever you're going to use in a clinic as part of ongoing care, which I think is, is really valuable, say if we talk about chronic kids, say if, it, if they come into clinic three times a year, four times a year, uh, I would introduce these things like once a year. Uh, I would not be too worried about the length of the protocol because it's part of their annual visit. But what's key in all of this using these measures because families get burnt out if they're not immediately interpreted and feedback given, uh, like my experience, I go to the doctor, I fill out a lot of forms electronically, nobody asks me anything about them. You know, so I think lots of people have that experience. So I, I encourage you to, to use measures that one, take into account episodes. So not only think about the past week, uh, and to ensure that sort of the, the criterion for entry into the protocol is that they're immediately actionable. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, David. That's, I think that's really useful for, for us to think about. And I think, um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. They need to be useful, right? <laughs> There's no point in doing it if they're not going to be used. Um, but the next stage of the work is, is around uh, some, some qualitative work with um, clinicians and families around, you know, what they would like to do and, and you know, if, if this is important to them and how they would want to uh, receive the information uh, and how to integrate it into, into clinical care. So I think... I suppose in, in answering that second part of your question, I think, you know, your perspective is, is one that is really important for us to consider. And uh, I suppose in a way, hoping to capture those perspectives in that next phase of work around what's, you know, that clinician perspective and experience. 
um, and the episodic nature is absolutely correct because some of these recall periods are today. So, you know, as as you say, if a child has an, an episodic condition and we ask them about their quality of life today, that might be problematic. And I think that's something for us to consider. I suppose going back to the first part of your question, which I think is really around responsive, how responsive the generic instruments are to changes in health among children with chronic episodic chronic health conditions. Have I understood that correctly? It's more on what we do with that information. Yeah, I think it's important for us to consider, and I, I think in consultation with families and clinicians, hoping to, I suppose, flesh that out a bit more. Um, but yeah, we can't just ask the question and expect the clinician just to um, know what to do. We need to have pathways for action. So um, one, one thing I would add, uh, you know, I think Australia is probably better, it, at least it, in theory, in thinking about health care as being not only the biomedical, but also the psychosocial. I think whenever we include a psychosocial piece, the first thing we add is, well, what is the burden? Is it gonna slow us down? Which right away minimizes or discounts the importance of looking at well-being and quality of life of the child with a chronic condition. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of have uh, the, the, the criteria, how long does it take? Maybe for population-based studies, I understand that. But for, for the patients themselves, I think they are ready, uh, in my experience doing this for more than 30 years, they are ready to, to complete forms that take them 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, providing that they speak to the issues that they encounter and that it's used as part of ongoing care. Yeah, thanks, David. And I think that's that's really important. And I think what you touched on is a, a I suppose a broader, uh, sorry, hoping that's right. I'll be um, I, I think uh, broadening our our healthcare for children with chronic health conditions in Australia outside of just that biomedical framework is is a, a key component of why we're really interested in doing this. When we spoke with families, that's you know their healthcare experience in that outpatient, that specialised outpatient setting was limited by the fact that they, they felt that that care was just focused on that biomedical aspect and they really wanted that broader psychosocial care. And our hope was that in, in introducing a measure that might engage some of those broader aspects um, that we might, might be able to think about that more. But I think that's, a, that's still yet to be determined if that is actually true or not. But <laughs> I'd love to maybe reach out to you and I think you've obviously got a lot, a lot of experience in this area and I think I've learned a lot from you so I'd welcome that thank you we have Dr Lewis who has her hand raised go ahead please Dr Thanks so much. Really wonderful talk. Um, my question is about how we can understand acceptability in a, a more uh, nuanced way. Um, and so I'm think so I'm a specialist, a, a pulmonologist, and I do a lot of work with asthma. And I've used a, a validated quality of life questionnaire in research contexts, but in different populations than it was originally validated in. So um, the, the most commonly used asthma quality of life questionnaire is uh, was originally published by Juniper. It was validated in a Canadian population. There's been iterations since, but I've been using it in Detroit, which is a, a, a very different kind of population. Uh, the other context would be an asthma control test, which is really more going towards symptom management, but we use that routinely in everyday practice. Um, and in both cases, you get feedback from people taking the questionnaire that this is a weird question or, or these 
answer categories don't make sense. And they, they sort of stumble with how to answer the question because it just doesn't, it's not phrased well in a way that's meaningful to them. So I'm just wondering as you're specifically looking at comparing questionnaires, either in a you know single country setting or as you think about expanding internationally, is there any way to get either qualitative or quantitative feedback from people taking these questionnaires about the I, I think of it as acceptability, but there, maybe there's another term, usability, understandability uh, of, of the questions and the answer categories. Yeah, a, a fantastic question. I think a, a really important thing for us to explore. So I think we can explore the quantitative acceptability in a, I think, a restricted way around you know, we have a group of children with asthma and we ask them to fill out an asthma questionnaire and then we ask them to fill out the generic. So we could compare in those groups, you know, that group of children, do they prefer, you know, do they find it easier to fill out the asthma questionnaire than they do the generic questionnaire, but that has limitations. You know, whether they find it easy is a different question slightly to, you know, if they, uh, I suppose I think what you're referring to is like the face validity of it, do they, is it understandable to them? Does it cover the questions that they think it should? And I think asking those questions in a research survey versus patients in a, in a clinical setting is also a slightly different question. And I, I do hope that we will be able to do some qualitative work with families uh, before and after we sort of do this small trial to ask them those sorts of questions, you know, like, did, did you know, did they understand the questions? Did they feel that it was useful? What did that, you know, sort of really exploring with them. And I think doing that qualitatively is, is probably the, the only way to really get at, at, at that, to answer that question. So I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I would just encourage you to do that because I think that's the, and, and again, it, sound, it seemed like the population that you were surveying in the data that you presented to us had some um, variability in background, uh, thinking about your non-English as the first language um, question and, 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 look, and analyzing your data, looking at that subgroup to see if there's d differences there. Because I, I think from a... Um, sort of extending on what Dr. Sandberg was saying, like when you think about actually utilizing these questionnaires, um, the practical acceptance of, of the questionnaire, it also, you know, it's linked to how easy is it, how understandable is it, how fast was it, but also what um, Dr. Sandberg was saying is what do you get out of it, right? Like is, do I get the sense that my, um, in the clinical setting, at least, you know, is the clinician going to use this information or not, or am I just wasting my time filling it out? So uh, all, all of the above. Thank you. A, a great point. Yeah. Well, hopefully, absolutely. Please. My apologies for stepping out, everyone. My child hit, ran into a pool in school and lost two. So there's a little chaos there. Um, Thank you, Renee, for a great talk. Um, we, I, I think we're about at the end. Is there anything in the chat we need to address? Oh, just here. No, thanks. Perfect. Um, thank you all for joining us online in hybrid, and thank you particularly to Renee for joining us from uh, across the world. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I know some of us are meeting with you the next couple of days, so we'll touch base then. And uh, have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thanks.